Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Probably it's time to get us started. Uh, it's my huge honor today to introduce uh, Dr. Jordi Mahonis from the uh, uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health, John Hopkins University. Um, Dr. Dimopoulos got his uh, bachelor's degree in microbiology in the University of uh, uh, Stockholm, Sweden. And then he moved to a much warmer place uh, to get his PhD at the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology uh, in the University of Crete, uh, Greece, in the 1990s. Uh, he did his postdoctoral work uh, in uh, European Molecular Biology Lab in uh, Hedenburg, Germany. And then he was a uh, senior lecturer uh, in the uh, Imperial College in London. He joined the, uni uh, he joined the uh, John Hawkins University in 2003 uh, because of the establishment of the uh, Malaria Research Institute. Uh, he has done uh, incredible research on the uh, molecule biologies of mosquitoes that transmit human pathogens uh, for more than two decades. And he has published papers on high profile journals uh, such like Science, PNS, and the Plus Pathogens. Uh, his ongoing and future research uh, focuses broadly on the uh, uh, immune responses of mosquitoes and how the microbes uh, in the mosquito gut can affect the transmission of mosquito bomb diseases. Uh, he has an MBA uh, with a concentration in management and leadership. Um, he also is, he is famous as the paperless professor because he does almost everything uh, electronically and he even published a, uh, a book about it, which is called Paperless Joy, and it is available in a uh, paper format. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's our pleasure today to have him come to us. Please welcome him. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy, for inviting me, and thank you, everyone, for having me here and, and coming to the seminar. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first visit to Davis. I've heard about and, uh, about the uh, university, the research, and I've known people, I have friends here for many, many years, and it's really a pleasure for me to come and, and meet you all. Um, and we can talk about the paperless office and, and things like that, and the reason why I published it in the paper format is because those who really need uh, to read that book, they're still using paper. <laughs> so, um, but today I'm going to talk about mosquitoes, I'm going to talk about mosquitoes that transmit human pathogens. And I'm mainly going to talk about malaria. Um, uh, there are uh, methods to uh, control malaria today, uh, but we still have malaria and, and dengue and other vector-borne diseases. And, and these uh, methods or strategies, they mainly focus on interrupting the interactions between the mosquito and the human host, or the pathogen and the human host, using insecticides, bed nets, Etc. or drugs or vaccines. For malaria, there are drugs, there are no drugs for dengue. There is no vaccine yet for malaria in the market. Hopefully there will be one one day. Um, my laboratory is interested in studying the interactions between the mosquito and the pathogen. And there is currently no method uh, that one can use in the field to interrupt this interaction, at least for malaria. For dengue, there is a symbiote, there is a Bolbachia bacteria that has just started to be used in the field that interferes with the mosquito and the pathogen. And there are two major lines of research that I will talk to you about today. Uh, one focuses on the mosquito's innate immune system and how that immune system is involved in controlling infection in the mosquito with plasmodium parasites and how we uh, are trying to use that knowledge of how the immune system works to develop mosquitoes that are incapable of transmitting malaria parasites and, and disease. And the other line of research focuses on the mosquito microbiota, the bacteria that naturally reside in the mosquito intestine and how this microbiome can influence mosquito susceptibility to these human pathogens, the malaria parasite and the dengue virus and how we think we could use the mosquito microbiome to develop novel control strategies. I started to work on mosquitoes in the early 90s. Uh, the reason why I started to work on mosquitoes was that at that time it was a black box, at least at the molecular level. And I had a choice when I started my PhD to work on a project on Drosophila that had been going on for many years, or to start to work on a project on mosquitoes that was just starting, and I, thought, I found that more exciting. And, and 
the journey that I have experienced uh, from the beginning of my PhD until this day has been really exciting. Uh, really starting from zero, when I started to work on mosquitoes, there were 13 genes uh, known from the Anopheles genome, and I've experienced the, the entire progress of the field. And I remember in the 90s and even in the 2000s, um, when you would talk to people who were not vector biologists about what you were doing, studying mosquito immunity, you'd always get a smile back. And you kind of knew what that meant. But things have changed today. It's actually a field that's become highly recognized. And there's a field that now has been recognized for its true potential to develop novel control strategies for these vector-borne diseases. And I also remember uh, in these early stages of our research that we didn't really know exactly how this knowledge could be employed for developing malaria control, for example. But over the past five to 10 years, some of these technologies are now starting to mature. And we can actually start to see, or imagine at least, how in the next five to 10 years, some of these technologies will be rolling out <coughs> in the field. So this is a really an exciting time, I think, for the field, having seen it mature to this stage. So let me tell you a little bit about our stories on the, uh, our research on the mosquitoes in the immune system. The malaria parasite is ingested uh, through an infectious blood meal. The parasite will undergo several developmental transitions in the mosquito. It will eventually invade the mosquito mid-gut epithelium. It will traverse it. It will form an oocyst. And within this oocyst, thousands of sporozoites will develop, and they will eventually end up in the salivary gland. And at around 15 days after the mosquito has ingested this infectious blood meal, it can start to transmit the sporozoites through a second blood meal. If you look at the numbers of parasites that you find in either the human host or the mosquito vector at different stages of infection, you will notice something very interesting. You will notice this infection bottleneck that occurs in the mosquito. The parasites at this stage of infection in the mosquito gut will reach their <coughs> lowest number. If you collect mosquitoes in the field, and you find malaria infected, malaria parasite infected mosquitoes, you will rarely find a mosquito with more than two to three oocysts. These mosquitoes have frequently ingested up to 10 to the 11th parasites. And this number is then compressed down to five. It turns out that the mosquito's innate immune system plays an important role in this reduction and in this infection bottom. And that's why we and many other laboratories has focused at, on this stage of infection because we're thinking that this is probably one of the most promising sites to target infection if you want to disrupt this infection cycle and the spread of disease. The mosquito's innate immune system is primitive. Um, mosquitoes do not have an adaptive immune system. They don't have B cell memory or antibodies. Uh, but it's still quite sophisticated and there is a certain degree of specificity in it. There are several innate immune pathways or intracellular signaling pathways that control <coughs> insect immune responses at the transcriptional level. And some of the best studied pathways, but I wouldn't say the only pathways, there are other pathways that I'm not indicating here, are the TOL pathway, the IMD pathway, the JAK-STAT pathway, and then, they have, then we have the RNA interference pathway that is involved in antiviral defense. And through our work and works of collaborators and other labs, we have shown over the years that these pathways uh, are involved in controlling infections with different human pathogens. So for example, the TOL and JAK-STAT pathway and the RNAi pathway are involved in controlling dengue virus infection in Aedes mosquitoes. The IMD pathway in Anopheles mosquitoes seem to be more specific for controlling infection with the human malaria parasite Plasmodium falciparum. And for this reason, we have been particularly interested in studying the IMD pathway. The IMD pathway um, is activated by bacteria, malaria parasites, and other um, pathogens, presumably through pattern recognition receptors. The peptidoglycan recognition <coughs> protein is one of those receptors. Um, the signal is transduced through several intracellular uh, pathway components. 
there are also negative regulators of this pathway that lock this pathway. For example, Caspar is a negative regulator of the IMD pathway. Once the pathway is activated, it will result in the nuclear translocation of transcription factor REL2. REL2 will initiate transcription of a number of different innate immune uh, effector genes, some of which have been linked with plasmodium killing. So when this pathway is activated, plasmodium is targeted not by one single factor, but by multiple factors. And some of them, they form complexes, killing complexes that, that will kill the parasite. Others are likely to operate individually. We showed a few years back that the IMD pathway plays a conserved role in controlling plasmodium falciparum infection in different malaria vector species from different parts of the world in South and Central America, in Anopheles albimanus, Anopheles gambia is in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Anopheles stevensi in Asia. And we got particularly excited by this fact because we thought, well, the IMD pathway might be a promising system to manipulate for resistance to the malaria parasite. And when we decided to attempt genetic engineering of the pathway to generate parasite-resistant mosquitoes, we started to focus on transcription factor REL2. The strategy was to overexpress this transcription factor after a blood meal, when the mosquito has ingested the infectious blood meal. The idea was that this overexpression would turn on this battery and other effector genes that would target the malaria parasite more effectively than in wild-type mosquitoes that also has a functional IND pathway but it is nevertheless not turned on to the same degree and as early as it would in a transgenic model. So we cloned the uh, REL family transcription factor, REL2. We uh, fused it to a blood feeding activated gene promoter. We use a promoter of either a carboxypeptidase gene that is expressed in the gut tissue after a blood meal or we fused it to the promoter of a vitellogenin gene that is expressed in the fat body tissue after a blood meal. And then we integrated this transgene into the transgenic mosquito. This is our transgenic mosquito. One thing that you'll notice is that this transgenic mosquito is actually not carrying a foreign gene. Most often when we say a transgenic organism, what we mean is that we have made an organism that now expresses a new gene. We don't express a new gene. We've just changed the expression pattern of its own gene. We've made a mosquito that turns on its own immune system at a different phase, after a blood meal. And this is what happens in these transgenic mosquitoes. This promo these promoters that we have been using, the carboxypeptides and the vitellogenic promoter, they're turned on after a blood meal at around three to six hours after a blood meal. They peak at around 12 to 16 hours, and then they go down again. While in the wild type mosquito, this immune response is turned on later when the parasite is invading the midget epithelium. The idea here was that if we turn on this immune response at an early phase, it would be better and more effective at targeting the parasite. And we did show in our early studies that this immune response was indeed starting to target the parasite even prior to invasion of the midget epithelium. And we showed that the three transgenic lines that we had developed had a significantly greater resistance to the plasmodium falciparum parasite with a median number of osis zero. So this is the midgut specific gully expressed rel2 transgene. This is the fat body uh, tra expressed transgene. And this is a hybrid strain that was a cross between these two strains that expresses the rel2 transgene in both tissue compartments. So this looked pretty good to us as a first set of data. And later on, we actually started to play around with different factors of the IMD pathway. So we have now generated several independent transgenic lines where we overexpress different components on the pathway, either the pattern recognition receptor, which is upstream. We can knock down Caspar using a transgenic construct that expresses a Caspar double strand RNA. I showed you the results from the overexpression of REL2, but we have also generated lines that overexpress effector uh, genes that directly interact and kill the plasmodium falciparum parasite. And all of these lines show a greater resistance to the parasite. 
So let's say that we wanted to release a mosquito like this in nature. What do we have to make sure? First of all, we have to make sure that this mosquito is not just resistant to the one lab parasite that we have been working on, but we have to make sure that actually these mosquitoes show an increased resistance to different malaria parasites that you can find in nature. So here is an experiment where we infected these genetically modified mosquitoes with a Brazilian plasmodium falciparum and with an old world plasmodium falciparum clone. And we see this increased resistance pattern to all these parasites. So this was again quite promising. But here comes a more tricky part of this research, which concerns the fitness of these mosquitoes. It turns out that if you, if you change something in the genome of an organism, a gene for example, there is a dogma out there saying that there's going to be a fitness impact, that there's going to be a negative fitness impact. So we decided to actually investigate this, look at this in the laboratory. What is the impact of engineering the IMD pathway on mosquito fitness? We looked at a variety of different fitness parameters, and these are all in laboratory conditions, so obviously we cannot look at everything. We don't even know <coughs> all the different parameters that fitness is involved in. We looked at lifespan, we looked at lifespan in different conditions, that mosquitoes have taken one blood meal or multiple blood meals or, or infectious blood meals or mosquitoes that only fed on sugar. We could not observe any difference between our transgenic and wild type mosquitoes only one transgenic line showed a difference in fitness, but it turns out that this is a position effect. The transgene in this transgenic line integrated into an intron of another gene and sort of disrupted its expression. Because we have another line that has the same transgene with no fitness cost. We looked at fecundity. We looked at egg hatch rate and the number of eggs they would lay, no difference. We looked at the size of these mosquitoes no difference. We look at the feeding, how much would they feed, how much cloning would it take? No difference. It was getting very irritating, I'll tell you why. No difference in developmental time, sex ratio was the same. It's very difficult to publish this kind of data, <laughs> right? Especially when there is a dogma out there saying that if you change something in the genome there's going to be a negative impact on fitness because the organism in the field or in the laboratory has is perfectly adapted to its environment. But this is what we think is happening. <clears throat> Mosquitoes are like Mediterraneans. After a blood meal, they take a long siesta. <laughs> they rest, right? So what happens when an Anopheles gambia takes a blood meal, it goes and sits somewhere, it can't fly around with its belly full of blood, and it rests. The transgene is only overexpressed for about four to five hours. And this overexpression occurs at a time when the mosquito has ingested a blood meal. It has an excess of resources. There is no resource shortage during this time here. And we think that this is likely the reason why we haven't been able to observe a cost in the laboratory. In the field, there might be a different situation. We don't know yet. And in fact, studies in Drosophila have shown something quite similar. If you turn on the IMD pathway in Drosophila constitutively, there is a fitness cost in terms of longevity. If you turn it on transiently, there is no observable fitness cost. In some of these fitness studies, they even observe a, a greater agility. It turns out that the Drosophila with the transient, the activated IMD pathway could jump higher. Okay. So this looked really good. Then we decided to look at how competitive the transgenic mosquitoes are in mixed cage populations. So what we did, we took 50 genetically modified mosquito larvae and mix them with 50 wild type larvae. And we combine them and we rear them as a population over about 10 generations. And we did another experiment where we took equal proportions of genetically modified and wild type <coughs> adults as males or females and we rear them for many generations. And when we looked at the prevalence of the transgene in these cage populations. And if the transgene would not have caused any fitness cost. We would have expected 
that it would have fixed itself at around 75%, according to a hard divine equilibrium. And this is what happens. In the genetically modified mosquitoes that express the transgene in the gut tissue, the transgene fixes itself at around 90%, which was very, very strange. The mosquito strains that express the transgene in the fat body tissue, in those strains, the, mos the transgene fixes itself at around 75%, what we sort of would have expected. And this fixation persists over 10 generations. And here we are using two different transgenic lines that express transgenes of the IND pathway. Here we have the REL2 transgene, and here we have the DSCAM transgene in the gut tissue. So what this experiment is suggesting is that the transgene at these laboratory conditions provides an advantage to the mosquito. It was very puzzling. So we decided to look into this and try to figure out how is this possible? What is the advantage? Which biological system are we affecting through this transgene expression? Remember, in these experiments, we are not exposing the mosquitoes to plasmodium. So they don't have an advantage in terms of increased resistance to the malaria parasite. Right? We're just giving them a blood meal, they lay eggs, we take a certain number of those offspring, we put them in another cage, and so on. So the first thing we asked was, how do these genetically modified mosquitoes <coughs> differ from the wild type mosquitoes? Well, they differ in the following ways. They have a greater resistance to plasmodium falciparum. But we thought in these mixed cage populations that wouldn't matter because we don't expose them to plasmodium. But they also have a reduced mid-gut microbiota. And in particular, those strains that express the transgene in the gut. It turns out that the IMD pathway is also involved in controlling the <coughs> mosquito's intestinal bacteria, the microbiota of the mosquito intestine. And you can see here how these mosquito strains that express the uh, transgene in the gut tissue, the carboxypep that is in the hybrid line, they have a reduced microbiota. So we thought, well, maybe this reduced microbiota could in some way explain this phenomenon. Another thing that we observed in this experiment was that this fixation at 90% occurred rapidly. It didn't occur gradually. And what this meant was that it probably had to do with mating and not with longevity or egg laying or something like that. We can reduce the mosquito microbiota. We can almost eliminate them by rearing mosquitoes on sugar containing antibiotics. So what we decided to do was to repeat these mixed cage competition experiments with mosquitoes that had been rare on antibiotics and wouldn't have any bacteria. We would have reduced, we would have eliminated the bacteria from antibiotic treatment. So here we are looking at an experiment where we compare mixed cage populations with uh, septic mixed cage populations, or uh, mosquitoes that have not been rare on antibiotics to mosquitoes that have been rare on antibiotics. And what you can see here is that when you remove the microbiota from the mosquito, you do not observe this advantage in these strains that express the transgene in the gut tissue. So what this experiment is suggesting is that this advantage that the transgene is providing has something to do with the gut microbiota. I told you earlier that we suspected that mating could be playing a role here. So I have some very preliminary data. There's only one replicate, but I think they're still quite significant and interesting, so I decided to show them to you, where we actually looked into whether there is a change or a different in mating preference between the wild type and transgenic mosquitoes. So we performed experiments where we took transgenic males and wild type males to compete for a one wild type female. And my student, Pike, he performed several experiments in parallel. So he tested um, 24 
females of the carboxylate protease line and, and, and 22 females of the discount line. And he did observe that indeed there was a preference by around 62% uh, of the females of the carboxypeptidase line um, would, would prefer carboxypeptidase transgenic males. So we think that what this experiment is telling us that the difference we see in the fixation and the prevalence of the transgene is likely to relate to some mechanism of mating that in turn is quite likely to relate to the mosquito microbiome. Okay, and that's where experiments are right now. We're interested in digging into this deeper and looking at how exactly this might work. Is it that a wild type female uh, prefers uh, a male that uh, expresses a GM or vice versa? And we have to do a, a serious experiment now where we treat mosquitoes with antibiotic or not treat the antibiotic to look at this phenomenon and see whether we can reproduce it. I showed you earlier that this fixation persists over 10 generations, and over those 10 generations, the mosquito also uh, continues to be uh, more resistant to Plasmodium falciparum compared to the wild type. So this is good. However, there's a problem here. And the problem is that while the median osis number goes down to zero, the prevalence doesn't, right? So releasing these mosquitoes in a hyperendemic area where people may get hundreds of infectious bites per year is not going to have any impact on transmission because they're still going to get infectious bites. You really want to get this prevalence down to zero in the transgenic Asmodium resistant line. And what we are looking into right now is to use a multi transgene strategy where we're not just expressing one transgene that confers resistance to the parasite, but multiple transgenes. And the transgene that we have started to look at is a transgene that has already been studied by Tony James Lab at the University of Irvine. This is a uh, transgene that comprise that encodes a uh, antibody fragment that can bind to the surface of the sporozoite and it's fused to an antimicrobial peptide, it's a protein that has been shown to mediate killing of sporozoites. And in the preliminary experiments or the experiments that have been published by, by Tony James lab, this transgene appears to be very effective at targeting the parasite at this stage of infection. While the REL2 transgene that we have been working with appears to be very effective at targeting the parasite at this stage of the infection. So we're now very interested in putting these two transgenes into the same uh, mosquito, into the same genome, and look at the effect of dual expression of dual transgene, with the ultimate goal of generating mosquitoes that would have a prevalence close to zero in terms of infection. So that's where our research is standing right now on the trans manipulating the mosquitoes in an immune system for resistance to plasmodium. The IND pathway can be engineered for increased resistance to plasmodium. Additional transgene can be added for complete resistance. We hope that that is the case. And there are a number of different transgenes that we could test. There are a number of different proteins and factors that have been shown to be acting against the parasite in the mosquito. Transient Activation of REL2 or DSCAM has no impact on longevity, fecundity, or feeding at laboratory conditions. We have not been able to observe a fitness cost. We think that's because of the transient nature of this activation and the fact that it occurs after a blood meal. Gut expressed transient will prevail in a mosquito cage population in absence of plasmodium. The advantage of the transgene, we think, is related to the mosquito microbiota through a mating preference. And that is still under investigation. And we're very interested in teasing this mechanism out because if we understand this system, we could actually generate genetically modified mosquitoes that might even have an advantage, thereby not requiring a genetic drive system. So let me switch gears now and talk to you a little bit about the mosquito microbiota. 
and how we are studying the mosquito microbiota in terms of mosquito susceptibility to infection with human pathogens. If you dissect a mosquito gut at around uh, 20 hours after it has fed on a malaria-infected blood, you will find organic stage parasites and a variety of different bacteria. And it turns actually out that most of these bacteria can be cultured on simple media, LB agar plates. Just click the gut up on the LB plate and you can grow these bacteria. And some more recent comparisons, metagenomic <coughs> analysis with these low-tech agar plate uh, growth assays have shown that most of the bacteria in the mosquito gut are culturable. You also find fungi in the mosquito gut, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about those. But first I'll talk to you about microbiota components of the mosquito gut that negatively influences vector competence or the pathogen's ability to infect the mosquito. One of the early observations was that if you eliminate the mosquito microbiota with antibiotic treatment, the mosquitoes become more susceptible to malaria parasite infection and dengue virus infection. So this is an Anopheles and this is an Aedes aegypti. So what these experiments were telling us was that in some way, the microbiota of the mosquito intestine was having a negative effect on plasmodium infection. And we back then hypothesized that that could occur either through activation of the mosquito's immune system, because there is a great overlap between the antibacterial and anti-plasmodium immune responses. Another mechanism that could be responsible for this uh, increased resistance to infection in the presence of the microbiota could be the production of anti-pathogen molecules by the bacteria themselves. We decided to study this in nature and we went to different parts of the world, uh, malaria or dengue endemic regions, and we collected mosquitoes in the field, we brought them into the lab, and we isolated microbiota, bacteria that were contained in their gut. And we were interested only in bacteria that actually we could grow on simple LD agar media. And the reason for that was the long-term goal of our research was really to identify bacteria that could be developed and deployed as uh, biocontrol agents. And then you really don't want to work on something that you can't culture. And we established over the year a fairly comprehensive panel of different bacteria that came out of the guts of different uh, mosquito vectors. We brought them into the lab and we introduced them one by one into the mosquito gut. And then we infected these mosquitoes with either the plasmodium parasite or the dengue virus. And then we looked at the impact of the presence of these bacteria in the mosquito gut on susceptibility to infection. So this was our screening method to identify bacteria that could influence mosquito susceptibility to these human pathogens. And I'm sh this is a screen. Uh, here uh, we're looking at a number of different bacteria that when introduced into the mosquito gut would compromise susceptibility to plasmodium falciparum infection. And you can see that compared to the control mosquito here that has over 40 osses on the gut, all these other mosquito cohorts into which we have introduced different numbers of each of these bacteria, they have a much lesser infection. And we have mainly focused on three different bacterial isolates. An enterobacter that we identified in southern Zambia, a serratia that we identified in the Johns Hopkins insectary, and a chromobacterium that we identified in Panama. And we were interested in these bacteria because it turns out that they have some quite interesting properties. Enterobacter can block plasmodium in the mosquito. And it does so through the production of reactive oxygen leeches. And we're quite interested in understanding this mechanism of inhibition. The serratia isolate also blocks plasmodium in the mosquito. And it shortens the mosquito's lifespan. It also produces in vitro antipathogen activity. So what that means is that if you expose an in vitro culture of plasmodium to this serratia culture supernatant, it will inhibit that culture. One of the most interesting bacteria we identified is a chromobacterium. It came out of an Aedes aegypti mosquito in Panama. We like this bacterium in particular because it can block both plasmodium and dengue virus in the respective vectors. 
It has a very potent larvicidal and aldolficidal activity for both of these mosquitoes. And it produces stable metabolites with in vitro antipathogen activity. All these studies have been published, so I'm not going to go into details here. I'm just showing these as examples of the type of bacteria we're interested in, the type of properties we are interested in. I'm just going to run through very quickly some of the data on this slide here on the chromobacterium that has been published in Cross Pathogens uh, in October last year. And here are some of the properties we are interested in. We're interested in the ability of these bacteria to colonize the mosquito gut. We're looking at whether they actually can shorten the lifespan of the mosquito. And here we are looking at adult Anopheles gambia, Anopheles aegypti, and here we are looking at larvae. We have basically spiked the larval breeding water with this chromobacterium. As you can see here, they will rapidly die off. And of course, we are looking at the ability of these bacteria to compromise susceptibility of these uh, uh, mosquitoes to their pathogens. So these are the properties we're interested in. Colonization persistence, entomopathogenic activity, and in vivo antipathogen activity, as well as in vitro path antipathogen activity. So how do you introduce these probiotics into mosquitoes in the field? Let's say that we have now established a panel of bacteria that either shorten the mosquito's lifespan or, or block the pathogen infection in the mosquitoes. How do you get these bacteria into the mosquito gut? What we're thinking of is to use the mosquito's need to feed on sugar and lactose. And in fact, devices have already been developed and systems have been tested out in the field by which one can expose mosquitoes to toxins through these kind of honey bait stations, sugar bait stations. And we're actually really thinking of running cocktail parties for mosquitoes in the field, using uh, different <coughs> types of attractive nectars or nectar, artificial nectar cocktails spiked with a bacteria or maybe even a cocktail of bacteria that will have these kind of activities. And this is really where our research is right now, to try to see whether it is feasible to use these strategies in the field. Another line of research on these bacteria is focused on understanding their mechanism of inhibition. We're very interested in understanding the biology of inhibition. Some of these bacteria, like the chromobacterium, for example, produces a secondary metabolite that inhibit pathogen uh, uh, infection in vitro. And some of these metabolites are also quite stable. You can desiccate them, you can, you can, you can heat them, and they're still there. And they could be interested, interesting uh, in terms of drug discovery. And here I'm showing you uh, an example, an, an experiment, a, a sugar feeding experiment in the lab where we can see that the mosquito that feeds on sugar, that sugar, if you, if you color it with a food color, it will end up in the, in the crop, it will also end up in the bed gut. And this is the way we introduce the bacteria into the digestive system, into the gut, where they can interfere with pathogen infection. So I have showed you examples of bacteria that colonize the mosquito gut. They were identified in the guts of the mosquito. And that could possibly be developed into uh, disease control agents, either through their ability to block pathogen infection in the mosquito or to shorten the mosquito's lifespan. And we're very interested in now starting to look at these bacteria and how they can be deployed and used to uh, uh, in mosquito in mosquito exposure experiments in the field using these kind of malaria scare facilities. So the take home message here is that the variety of mosquito mega bacteria exert transmission blocking activity. Um, some of them also shortens the mosquito lifespan and some mega bacteria produce secondary metabolites of pharmacological interest. I'm going to end my talk by showing you an interesting example of some microbiota components that has an opposite effect. They actually make mosquitoes more susceptible to infection. In one of our uh, field studies in uh, Puerto Rico, we identified a variety of fungi in the mosquito gut. And we performed similar types of experiments as I showed you earlier. We introduced these fungi into the mosquito gut, and then we looked at how that would affect susceptibility to plasmodium infection. And what Ben noticed in these experiments was that two penicillium isolates, when present in the mosquito gut, would render the mosquito more susceptible to infection. Then he took these fungi, he cultured them, and he filtered them. 
So he would basically only feed, feed the mosquito on a cell-free, um, on the sacred tome, if you want, of these fungi. And when he did that, he also observed an increased susceptibility to plasmodium falciparum infection. When he boils his fungal filtrate for one hour, 95 degrees Celsius, they retain the activity. They still render the mosquito more susceptible to infection. Which tells us that there is a very stable metabolite that these fungi produce that render the mosquitoes more susceptible to plasmodium infection. I showed you transgenic mosquitoes earlier that we have developed that are more resistant to parasite infection. So we decided to actually look at whether if these mosquitoes harbor these fungi in their gut, or whether if they are fed on this filtrate, would this resistance be retained? So we fed the transgenic mosquitoes on the fungi or the fungus filtrate, and we looked at the uh, resistance that these mosquitoes had to the plasmodium parasite. And this is what we observed. The presence of the fungi in these genetically modified mosquitoes would completely abolish the resistance. What this experiment suggests is that whatever these fungi are producing, it is quite likely to exert an immune suppressive activity. It interferes with the killing mechanism of plasmodium that is controlled by the IMD pathway. And this is where this research is standing now. We're very interested in identifying these molecules. The microbiome of mosquito has not really been extensively studied. There are a couple of studies only, and here are two studies from uh, uh, mosquito microbiome studies in Brazil, and both of these studies actually identified penicillium fungi in the gut of malaria and dengue bacteria. So we're thinking that this type of environmental fungi could actually influence transmission of disease quite significantly. It remains to be looked at. What is the translational significance of this? I mean, how could you use a fungus like this for something useful in, in the fight against malaria, for example? Well, the only thing I've thought about is that there are actually some groups that are very interested in making mosquitoes more susceptible to plasmodium. <coughs> And these are people who are developing vaccines based on live attenuated sporozoites. They've actually spent a considerable amount of time and efforts to genetically modify mosquitoes that are more susceptible to infection so they can produce more sporozoites. So we're thinking that this type of molecule or fungal extract could actually be used to optimize the production of these type of vaccines. But that's really the only thing I could think about. So penicillium fungi render mosquitoes more susceptible to plasmodium infection, possibly through an immune suppressive mechanism. Fungal exposure in the field could influence disease transmission, and we obviously are interested in going into the field now and looking at the prevalence of these type of fungi and whether they are present at the amounts, if you want, or at the, if they infect the mosquitoes to the degree where they actually could have an impact on the susceptibility to these pathogens. So I've showed you examples of different types of components of the mosquito microbiota that can influence susceptibility to pathogen infection in both directions. So you can imagine this is a very complex system, right? But we think that the mosquito microbiota is likely to play a very important role in regulating transmission of disease in the field. And it's still, a, I consider it a virgin field. I mean, there is very little done in the field in terms of understanding the influence of the mosquito microbiota on disease transmission. And with that, I would like to uh, uh, close and thank uh, the different members of my lab that have been involved in this research over the past uh, roughly 10 years. And of course, our collaborators that have provided resources and helped us with things that we really couldn't do on our own. And, and, and at last but not least, our funding agencies, mainly the NIH and the Malaria Research Institute at Johns Hopkins. And thank you. Uh, I think we have time for questions. How much is known about the particular effector systems that actually interact with the plasmodium, the proteins, the peptides? Right. So there is actually, there is only 
There is one effector system that has been thoroughly studied by several groups, and it's a complement-like lytic mechanism that involves a thioester-containing protein and leucine rich repeat domain proteins that form a complex, they interact with the surface of the okinate, they form a complex, and they're believed to lyse the okinate. And TEP1, which is one of those thioester-containing proteins that I, um, uh, uh, I mentioned, is actually controlled by the IMD pathway. So we believe that that IMD pathway plays an important role in controlling that system. But it's probably not the only pathway. The J and K pathway has also been shown to be linked into that system. And we have looked at whether, we're now looking at whether these fungal extracts are interfering with this uh, TEP1 complex, uh, complement-like complex and lytic mechanism. Great. George? Um, you evaluated your GM mosquito on different plasmodium strains, old world and new world? Yes, yes. Um, did you also try evaluating um, it on different mosquito uh, genetic backgrounds? We haven't done that. We haven't done that. These are Anopheles Stevens mosquitoes that we have used. And we're quite interested in uh, maybe crossing these transgenes into different genetic backgrounds and eventually we'd love to generate these uh, uh, transgenic Anopheles gambia mosquitoes too and then start to do that. But I think first we have to really uh, identify and determine a transgene or a transgene combination that can result in complete resistance in terms of prevalence. I think at this stage we, we were still looking at different transgenes. Sure. Do you think your um, interesting findings on uh, fungal metabolites um, might suggest a reassessment of the use of bovaria um, for mosquito yeah. control? I don't know. Um, bavaria uh, infects the mosquito of the surface, it penetrates, you know, the cuticle, it goes in and kills the mosquito. This penicillium fungi has no impact on mosquito longevity, at least. So we identified these fungi in the gut of the mosquito. Other studies have also identified penicillium fungi. So it seems that they're quite different. They're acting different. They actually don't know how Bavaria might influence susceptibility to We, uh, we culture, we culture. So we actually played in some of the guts on media that favor the growth of fungi, and we identified this penicillium, along with a number of other, we actually identified a, a Bavaria, a new Bavaria too, that was more potent than the one that you know we have seen in the literature quite a bit. So Bavaria is a very well established entomopathogenic fungi. In the gut? In the, in the gut, in the gut. Now, now I, have to, I have to say something here. These assays are complicated, right? I mean, you cannot exclude the possibility that some of these are contaminants. You know, it could it could have come from the gut. It could have come maybe from some. It could have come from the surface of the mosquito. You know, when you dissect it, it you can't exclude that possibility. Um, I should also mention that these penicillium fungi they don't produce penicillin. They have no impact. They don't inhibit the mosquito microbiota, the bacteria. Uh, they actually render the mosquito more susceptible to its own microbiota. So the mosquitoes that have these fungi in their gut, they have, a, they have a larger number of bacteria in their gut too, which is consistent with our hypothesis of immune suppression, that these fungi produces a molecule that suppresses the immune system. And there are many fungi that are known in the mammalian field that have immune suppressive activity through so-called mycotoxins. So there are a variety of different mycotoxins. So we're now looking at these fungal extracts for mycotoxins. And mycotoxins are very stable, they're very heat stable. You can, you can heat them up and boil them and they'll retain the activity. So the data are very consistent with, you know, I, I would bet that it's quite likely that we have a mycotoxin that is responsible for this activity. Yes? Uh, 
Um, well, we, we've shown that the fungus um, the fungus is in the gut. It inhibits. It seems to. It's likely to have an immune suppressive activity, and we haven't quite shown it. So the data suggests that that is a possibility. Um, what we need to really do is to look in nature whether um, the fungi that that mosquitoes may harbor in their intestine are they present at such numbers or amounts that they actually could exert this type of activity. If they can, then that might be a problem for using this kind of transgenic strategy. And that's why I think it's important, that's a good example, I think it's important to actually have multiple blocking mechanisms in the mosquito, not just one blocking mechanism, but having maybe one or two in the gut and one at the later stage. Yes? I saw the question. Um, in your, when you look at the different fungi, do you have anything across your seed by any chance? Uh, I don't think so. But I can double check that. Yeah, because I'm just curious because in, in the Felix, in my, I'm yeah. Okay. 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 Has Nosema been shown to uh, exert some activity on the insect or? Well, um, it's interesting because in the avian malaria system, mm -hmm. Felix rufus pasiatus, or pythians, mm -hmm. they have um, tested on the Right, that would be interesting to, to see whether it can influence uh, susceptibility to the infection. is to look at whether these transgenes might show some ectopic expression in the reproductive organs. I mean, these are promoters that are supposed to be specific for the gut of the fat body, but the truth is that no one has really looked carefully where exactly they're expressed. Uh, because that could explain maybe something. I mean, I can imagine the, the microbiome of reproductive organs could maybe influence mating efforts. Besides that, I, I don't know. I don't know how that, that's something we would have to look at. I mean, could there be, um, or could the gut microbiome in some way contaminate other organs that are important in this process? It's a possibility. This is a good example of how um, a lab that specializes on innate immunity of uh, mosquitoes is uh, sort of without knowing it now moving into the field of mating and reproduction, which is, you know, really not our our area of expertise, or how how a lab that studies microbiota. We started to look at the microbiota from an immune perspective. We were interested in understanding how it would influence the mosquito's immune system, and now a couple of years later, we have ended up, you know, doing HPLC and mass spec and NMR for bacterial metabolite discovery and bacterial genome sequencing. So it's kind of how research is making it drift into different areas. And, and this is something that I kind of like with our field, uh, with the mosquito field, it's, so, it, it's such a big field, there's so few people in it. And I'm always trying to recruit more groups into the mosquito field because I think there's so much interesting things to do. There's, my biggest problem in the lab is usually to stop people doing things. You know, so we're not going to look at that. No, we're not going to look at that. We're not going to look at that because you know you can't spread out too much. There's so much to do, and you do an experiment, and you know you there's another ten doors sitting there and waiting to be opened, right? So, so, uh, so these are good examples of exactly how that happens. It's something very interesting, and I think uh, mosquito mating um, and, and reproduction are fields that 
I consider have been sort of underrepresented in terms of activity, research activity over the past years. And now there are some new groups that uh, I hope will revitalize those fields. Thank you. All right, thank you very much.